Hey everyone, welcome back to Treehouse, friends. I'm Dan Gorgon, one of the teaching leaders here at Treehouse. And we're joined today by Paul Boag, co-founder of Headscape. Paul, thanks for coming. No problem. Really good to be here. Paul, can you tell us about your experience as a designer and with working with hundreds of clients mm -hmm. at Headscape? Wow. Um, you want me to sum up, you know, what is it? Nearly 20 years of web design. Maybe 140 in, characters. 140 like a characters. Yeah. I enjoy it. It's good. There you go. How about that? Excellent. <laughs> and you expand upon it, maybe okay. a blog post now. Okay. I, I absolutely love working with clients. I'm a bit weird like that. You get a lot of web designers that complain, don't they, about their clients and they hate clients and working with clients is horrible and they wish that they could go and, you know, set up Treehouse or something like that. But personally, I really enjoy working with clients. I feel find it a really rewarding experience to take it's almost a, a teaching thing, almost a little bit like what you guys do, that you have a client come in that really doesn't have a good understanding of how the web works, they need this website, and I get to educate them and take them through the process. And at the end of it, hopefully they end up with this website that they absolutely love, that they're really enthusiastic about, um, and they understand why the website is the way it is. So, you know, I don't believe in going away and, and creating magic without the client being involved and then presenting a design and going, ta-da, here's the magic moment. Instead, I work really collaboratively with clients and I will um, engage them in every step of the process so that they're learning along the way. So I mood board with them, I wireframe with them, we discuss business objectives together, we talk about users together, I try and get them involved in user testing, I really include the client as much as possible. So when the they get this final website, a, they feel like it's their website that they're passionate about, and B, they're, they've learned along the way, and they understand why the website is the way it is. Well, speaking of learning, you were in recently with us here in the studio yeah. and uh, delivering some content about running a successful web design business, something that you've done for now uh, over a dozen years. Yeah, yeah. Right? What can members expect from that series of videos? Well... I've got this, uh, you, what you want me to do now is say about how great and how wonderful it is, and, uh, but I'm going to lower expectations, <laughs> all right? <laughs> there is no guarantee that if you, if you do this particular course that you're going to walk away with a successful web design business. But what I do do is I do share my experiences of what's worked for me. The reason I, don't, I think you can't say um, you'll definitely walk away with a successful web design business is because it depends on your definition of success, doesn't it? What I may consider to be a successful web design business might be different to you. But we will look at all kinds of subjects that will certainly help you create a good foundation. So we look at marketing, we look at sales and pitching, writing proposals. We get into all kinds of stuff about building a lifestyle business. And what, no doubt we'll talk more about that later. But I also talk about things like um, getting work done. You know, I know it's a mm. stupid thing, but... You know, when you're trying to run your own business, you get so many interruptions, and how do you actually get, get stuff done? So we cover the whole kind of gamut of things that I've learned over the years about kind of making a web design business really work. I mean, it's a whole different set of concerns when you're working for someone else mm. versus working for yourself. Yeah. When you're working for someone else, there are those responsibilities, there are timelines, there are people that that literally are telling you what to do yeah. whereas you have to rely upon discipline yeah. and determination yeah. and also probably a great deal of guilt and mm -hmm. self-doubt when you're working for yourself right and also i think there's a lot of people have a lot of unrealistic expectations when mm -hmm. they start out so one of the things that people think is they they sit down and go well, hang on a minute i know i'm being charged out at 500 you know, dollars a day or whatever, and I know I'm getting paid considerably less. If I was working for myself, $500 a day times five days a week times 52 weeks in a year, wow, I'm going to be mm -hmm. raking it in. But then, of course, they forget holiday, sickness, admin, dealing with clients, accounting, chasing bad debts, all of these mm -hmm. kind of other things that surround running a web design business. And so often, people set up as a freelancer thinking they're going to you know, earn more, work less hours,
be their own boss. And instead, what ends up happening is that they undercharge themselves. They have to work really long hours because mm -hmm. they take on too much work and end up working a lot harder than they did before. And on top of which, instead of just having one awkward boss to deal with, now they've got every single client mm -hmm. who's being awkward and demanding. <laughs> so the reality of going freelancing, um, freelancer and running your own web design business is often very different from the expectations. And it's how to get back to that vision. How do you get back to a situation where you're working less, you're in control of the work that you're doing, and you're working with great clients you enjoy working with? And this is what the concept of a lifestyle business is yes. all about, yes. right? So you mentioned that. So what is the lifestyle business? What is, what is that? Yeah. Because I know it depends for everyone, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a different set of of needs and, and obligations, mm -hmm. but also defining success. So what is the lifestyle business? For me, there, there are kind of two fundamental ways of doing business, okay? There's um, the, the people that are entrepreneurs that set up a business, and the idea is they build it up, and then they sell it on, and they go and, and drink pina coladas on a beach mm -hmm. somewhere. And then there are lifestyle businesses, and these are businesses where you're creating, you go into business for yourself because you want to achieve certain things in your own life. You want to be able to work less, uh, maybe earn more money, be more flexible in your working hours, or whatever it is that you want. Um, and those are businesses that have to provide a return every day to you. It's not, yeah. you're not living for the future, you're living for today. And that's really the kind of business I think most people that set up a web design agency or go freelance are after. Um, yet, so much of the time we end up living for the future. Oh, it'll get easier. You know, once I'm more established, it'll be easier further down the line. You know, and today I have to put in really long hours and, and kind of give up my social life, but it'll be better later on. And that's not the way to live. You know, it's the old adage, and I always get this the wrong way round, of, you know, uh, we should, shouldn't be living to work, we should be working to live. No, mm -hmm. the other way around. See, I told you I'd get it the wrong way around. <laughs> you know, it's this idea that a business should facilitate your lifestyle mm -hmm. rather than your life being dedicated to your business. That's a lifestyle business. Well, I think some people starting out as freelancers or starting their own business may feel very nervous, very, very challenged by the fact that they don't have a lot of experience, a lot of uh, uh, projects in their portfolio. Yeah. And so the... <laughs> risk or, or the idea uh, could be that they should take whatever comes their way. Just yes. take anything they can, start padding the resume, yeah. and then later on that portfolio will look even better to the ideal clients they want yes. or, or the type of projects that they want to get. Is that a good strategy? When you're starting out, should you just kind of take whatever you can or should you, you, know, should you work with family, friends and family yeah, to do oh, yeah. those types of things? I mean, what, what do you recommend for people starting out? Yeah, this is a really difficult question mm. um, because it's the kind of the theoretical and the idealistic way of working and then mm -hmm. there's the reality of it. The reality is, to begin with, you take anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to get money behind you and, and a lot of freelancers do what is very sensible, which is that they build up their portfolio in evenings and weekends while they're doing the day job. Um, so that the point comes where they've just got too much work to deal with in evenings and weekends and they're kind of forced to go freelance. And that's probably the best way of working. In terms of working with friends and family, ouch. Um, yes. <laughs> never, never a good thing. But again, when you're starting out, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Mm -hmm. I think where it becomes important to be picky is in terms of how you present yourself to the world and how you market yourself. So... Um, although, you know, don't turn away work when you start off, but e equally don't advertise yourself or promote yourself as being a jack of all trades and master of none. You know, decide who you want to target and, and target that group of people. You might specialize, as I say in, in the, the videos that we cover, you might specialize in e-commerce sites or WordPress sites. You might focus in a particular geographical area or in a particular sector like charity websites or higher education websites. So there's a difference between what you accept as work that kind of comes to you and what you actively pursue, if that makes sense. So that's kind of how I would divvy it sure. up. And does it help to have an interest, you know, a passion in the subject matter or in the 
perhaps the cause behind some of these clients and, and mm -hmm. projects as well. I, I can imagine that it would be much easier to think about that work. Yeah. You know, when you think about, oh, I have this project to do and I have this client I have to take care of, it must be much easier to think about doing those projects yeah. when you have a personal stake or a personal interest in them. Absolutely. It, it makes a huge difference. I mean, I, one of the big sectors that we work in is the charity sector. And working on charity websites is so much re more rewarding than working on you know, mm -hmm. some boring ass government website or something. <laughs> um, you know, because of the subject matter, because of what it is you're promoting. That said, I think you need to cultivate in yourself um, the ability to get enthusiastic and passionate about whatever it is you're working on. Mm -hmm. Because finding that thing in a project that sets you on fire is absolutely key because the client will pick up on, if you don't care about a project, a client will know that. Mm -hmm. And that's when they'll have to start caring more, which means they start micromanaging and they start getting involved in things you don't want them to get involved in. So find something on the project that makes you passionate. It might be the subject matter, or it might be the technology you're applying to, or you're using a new technique, or you've seen this really cool design trick that you want to try out, or whatever it is. Find something in every project that you can get excited about. If you're excited about a project, you will carry the client with you. And, you know, and actually, enthusiasm will take you such a long way. I've joked on the videos that I've recorded for you guys about how I have one client where um, I was getting so excited and enthusiastic, the client said to me, how can I possibly say no to you, Paul? It would be like kicking a puppy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that kind of sums it up. If you're enthusiastic, you'll take the client with you. So on that note, uh, I think that many of us would imagine that the perfect client would be one that uh, wants to, well, really wants to pay you a million dollars to do nothing, oh, really nothing at yeah, all. Yeah, I'd agree um, with that. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of the ideal client, um, and, I, and I suppose it, it also depends on the skills and interests and everything, but, you know, what is the perfect client? What, what, is, yeah. what is a great client? What makes them up? And, and for people that, maybe people that are watching this, that are thinking about contracting with others, yeah. how can they be a better client mm. for a project? That's a really, there's kind of two questions there. Sure. I mean, you're right, the perfect, the perfect client is definitely one that pays you a million dollars and doesn't require anything sure. back. I, I think we're all in agreement on that. Sure. But being a little bit more realistic about it, for me, it's, it's all about um, engagement and relationship. Okay, so if you have a client that's willing to engage and get stuck in, roll up their sleeves and get stuck into the process, that goes such a long way. The clients that just want you to go away and produce a website, actually you would think that they would be the best clients because they, you know, they're, they're hands off and they're letting you do your thing. But actually what normally happens is you produce a website and then they complain and moan about it. So you really want a client that kind of engages from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you need is a client where there is a really good rapport between you and that client, all right? They're kind of people that you get on with personally. And the reason that's so important is because if, you're, if you actually build a relationship with your supplier or your client, depending on which side of the fence you're on, then it, it, it makes everything go much, so much smoother. You tend to be much more laid back about um, problems and challenges which inevitably come up. You recognize that this person is trying really hard on your behalf. And so it kind of shifts the relationship and, and makes things go much smoother. But also, as a, as a web designer, if you've got a client which you just get on with, you feel more relaxed and willing to challenge them and say, well, I don't think that's necessarily the best way. Perhaps we could try this instead. And that's where things really spark. But it works the other way around as well, that if you respect your client, then you're willing to listen to their ideas and opinions. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that stroppy moment that we all have as designers going, I'm the designer, listen to me. <laughs> you know, it's much more of a kind of two-way relationship. I mean, the best client that I ever, ever worked with um, was for a large e-commerce site. And um, he, he would, um, I would always be pushing him and challenging him and he would push me back and he called me a, a, a pinko communist because I always put the <laughs> user first and I called him a man, money grabbing capitalist because he just wanted to extract money <laughs> from people. And that was the kind of relationship we had and it was great and it worked really well. 
So it's those, and he was really engaged as well. So it's those two factors, be engaged, get a client that's engaged and also get somebody you get on with. That's what you're really looking for. And here's the important thing. If you go through that initial proposal stage and you're going in the back of your head, oh, I'm not sure about this, be brave, be brave and walk away. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult at the beginning of project, year projects and you're trying to keep yourself busy, but it's so important. If those things aren't there, it'll be a bad project and you're mm -hmm. not gonna make money out of it. And I think, you know, those those two characters that you talked about probably would make a good sitcom. Probably yeah. A good half hour comedy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the web designer and the client. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking <laughs> about the, the pinko communist and the capitalist money grabber. That's them. That would be yeah, perfect. <laughs> so for, uh, for designers and developers working in the industry now, uh, you know, they're, they're so very busy with client work and, and maybe they even have a day job, but, you know, they have all these other obligations as well, family and everything else going on. It's extremely busy. Yeah. To, uh, it's extremely busy and it's extremely difficult at times to stay current. Yes. You know, new things come out all the time, new versions of, of software and updates to language and, and new apps. How do I mean? How do you stay current? You know, how do how do you stay current? How does the team at Headscape uh, stay current? And you know, what advice can you offer for designers and developers out there? To be honest, this this whole thing of we're all so busy, okay, we're as busy as we allow ourselves to be, mm -hmm. right? Work will expand to fill the space that you give it. I'm a great believer in working smarter rather than longer. So there are all kinds of techniques that we talk about in the, in the videos about how to do that. But I think um, what I would really encourage is you have to set aside time. Whether you think you've got that time or not, you have to set aside time to do research, to keep up to date, to, to keep engaged with things. Um, and ring fence that and refuse to compromise over that time. And you will find you'll get the work done you will get the work done within the available time that you give it. You give it. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And it, it feels like it makes no sense, but it works. So that's one part of it is ring fencing time. Um, I think it's also about not kind of picking and choosing where you learn from, okay? The, the internet is full with amazing content, okay? And you can end up looking in so many different places that you're actually seeing a lot of the same thing again and again and again in various forms. So I think narrow it down and pick a small number of sources that you work from. You know, Treehouse might be one example, but equally it could be, you know, certain RSS feeds of certain people that you read, but limit the number of sources you go to. Find certain individuals that are trustworthy sources and rely on them to do a lot of the filtering for you. So that's another thing that you can do. So there are lots of ways, essentially, of, of kind of managing your time, managing the sources that you're looking at in order to not get too overwhelmed by it all. Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> yeah. Or Doctor Who. Oh, that's really cruel. Oh, I didn't say there were going to be easy questions. You see, now that's really unfair. Mm. I'll tell you why it's unfair. Because Battlestar Galactica is, without the be a doubt, the best piece of sci-fi television that's ever been made, right? So it, on that basis, it has to win. Mm. But in terms of emotional attachment, as a British guy <laughs> that grew up, you know, tea times on Saturday, sitting down with my parents, watching Doctor Who, hiding behind the sofa, because I really did do that, mm -hmm. Um, being terrified of it, and then as an adult, where it's been rebooted and restarted and having my son and connecting with him, it's got to be Doctor Who. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to go Doctor Who. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, you were going to cop out in the end there. You were going to no, say, no, no, both of them. I've got, uh, I've got to follow my heart, okay. and that's what I've got to do. Okay. Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, Star Wars. That's easy. Okay. All right. Um... Uh, You're making up questions as you go along now, aren't you? I no, this is, this is for the, the middle part, the sci-fi section. Oh, the sci-fi section That's, of the show. You didn't see that part. I didn't know that was in uh, it. Last question uh, of the sci-fi part. Yeah. The Doctor yeah. or Sherlock Holmes? <gasps> well, Sherlock Holmes isn't sci-fi. 
Yeah, so that's fine. Still they're pretty much some, one and the same thing yeah. these days, aren't they? Uh, I mean, really? you've got Stephen Moffat Other. writing Doctor Who. You've got Stephen Moffat writing Sherlock. So there you go. It's the same character, basically. Okay. It's got to be Doctor Who. That's one answer. Because he's a, he's a time-traveling <laughs> alien. I mean, that's got to be cooler than Sherlock Holmes. Okay, fair enough. And also, I'm a good, wholesome person. I mean, you know, Sherlock Holmes, he's a drug addict. How could I possibly support that? Okay, after the show, you can tell yeah, me I'll what tell you really the truth, think. Though, okay. Later. All right. Now, back so we're to gonna the talk program. About web design, back yeah. to the program. <laughs> when Headscape and other design agencies are looking for new talent, yes, uh, obviously there are certain positions where you have specific needs, and other yeah. times you're just you're looking for someone great. Now, yeah. what is it you're looking for in new talent for someone that wants to come work for you? Is it do you have to have? Uh, or is there work experience versus college diploma? Right, yeah. Uh, but what is it exactly? Okay, to some extent, it depends on who you're hiring, right? I'll be honest. Designer, I don't give a monkeys what their education is. It's all about their portfolio, okay? If they've got a great portfolio of work, then I'm sold. With developers, it's a little bit more complicated because having a, um, having a university education in computer science provides certain analytical skills that are really useful for a developer. But put it like this, I'm not going to ever rate, you know, bits of paper that highly compared to, to um, real world experience. Um, and I recognize you get into this catch 22 of how do you kind of start in your career because everybody wants experience and you don't have experience. So we're very careful not to judge too heavily on experience. We'll do, if you haven't got a lot of experience, we'll set you a test to do. We'll give you a coding challenge. And if you can do that, then that, that answers our questions. But to re be honest, really skills, skills are the easy bit, right? Um, I can teach anybody, well, you can teach anybody, that's what you do, you, sure. know, you can teach anybody to, to learn how to code pretty much anything or to do design, that's easy, right? You know, I can hire someone, I can give them a treehouse account, off they go and they can learn it. What really matters are finding the people with the right personality and right attitude. So every, cult, every um, company has its own culture. And you need to find people that fit in with that culture, that kind of have the same outlook on life. Not the same types of people. You don't want everybody to be a clone of one another, but kind of have the same attitude towards work and the same attitude towards business and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one aspect. Then you need people that are real tinkerers, for want of a better word. People that are obsessed with playing with the web, right? Because the web changes so rapidly, you know, you can have a university degree in whatever you want, but that's going to be irrelevant in two, three years' time. What matters is somebody that's a lifelong learner. Um, there are lots of different ways of learning, but the, 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 the way that I love the most are people that experiment and play. You know, I, I love it when our designers and developers, um, you know, create some new little way of doing things and they show it to me and it's like, right, we're going to use that from now on. I had mm -hmm. a classic example recently. We, one of the challenges we have at Headscape, as a lot of web design agencies do, is how to show a client responsiveness, you know, when you're at the kind of design stage. And our designer had, you know, been working till three, four in the morning just playing with some clever app that, you know, allowed design to reformat itself to show to clients. And, you know, he wasn't getting paid to do that. But he did it anyway, and it's mm -hmm. that kind of obsessive compulsive behavior that I love, you know. But it's not about the working the long hours, it's about the playing and experimenting. Sure. So, and this is the last question. Okay. So I've got to be, is it a really good question? It's a, no, it's, it's got probably to be the, the worst best one. question. You've I got think it's, on I left it for last. It's you, the worst one. You, oh, yeah. I'll make it the best answer then. What is the web design? <laughs> <laughs> that web thing, what is it? <laughs> so, what is it about design that you're truly passionate about? I mean, what is, what is the thing that drives you now to work on client projects and will continue to drive you to work on projects in the future? That's making the assumption that I still am passionate. Perhaps I'm just jaded and twisted and bitter. Could be. So that, that would be a real high to end the interview Sure. On. Luckily, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I'm still enthusiastic. What is it about design? I mean, I'm not a hands-on designer anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's an important thing to say. I, I work with clients on a consultative basis. Um, I think what I love about my job, and I've always loved, is 
what we just talked about is that it's forever changing. There's always something new. There's always a new technique. There's always something new to explore and to, um, to challenge you. And every client project I get in has got some nuance to it that challenges me. You know, it's got, a, I mean, that e-commerce site I mentioned earlier, their average user was in their 80s. 80 years old, that was the average mm -hmm. you know, user. And so that had an amazing target audience to work with that created brilliant challenges. Other times, it's, there's some real kind of complexity in the technology that needs solving or a design challenge that I've never encountered before. Even after nearly 20 years in web design, every project has got something mm -hmm. new to it. Whether it be some horrible politics within the organization that I have to work r around. You know, it's that challenge that keeps me going. Um, and as soon as, as soon as the web becomes an established industry, like, I don't know, engineering or architecture, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, you know, that, that I've lost interest then. Off to sip uh, drinks on the beach. Yes. yes. Although, because I've built a lifestyle business rather than one with an exit strategy, I'm totally stuffed. <laughs> because I haven't <laughs> planned a business like that. But, you know, it's never too late to start. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. And, and for our members that want to continue to follow you, where can they find you? The podcast, yes? Yeah, I do a um, web design podcast at boagworld.com. Um, but I also put out loads of blog posts as well. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, seriously, check out the stuff that I've done at Treehouse as well because I've, I've really enjoyed doing it. It's been a brilliant couple of days doing that. And um, hopefully there's some useful stuff in there as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for watching this episode of Treehouse Friends. We'll see you next time. <laughs>